Alright, hi everybody, I'm Bethlehem Niker and I'm very glad that you all got a chance to giggle at the Lemonade Stand song. The Lemonade Stand was perhaps one of my favorite games on the Apple IIe and I haven't played it in well over a decade so if anybody could hook me up right after this presentation I would be just ever so appreciative. Again, I am Beth Lynn Eicher. I run the Ohio Linux Fest. The Ohio Linux Fest is fresh approaching. It is a free and open source conference coming to Columbus, Ohio in two weeks. I'm going to go ahead and pass this around for anybody who's interested. A nice fresh flat air off the presses. And I'm going to go ahead and plug something else really quick. I work for Arcutech. We are a solutions consulting company. I can help you out with the very best prices with hardware, software, solutions, and as well as cloud and services. We also offer all sorts of free consultation services. So please let me know if you've got um, any projects going on. Happy to have that conversation with you. How I came to uh, computing or vintage computing is a, a very personal story for all of us. Um, my personal story is whenever I was a high school student, I had discovered that there was something going on in my town, hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which was called the Supercomputing Conference. And I just absolutely begged my mom to let me cut school for senior year just for at least one day to go down uh, to see the overall conference. So she took me down there thinking that they would say, go away, kid. They said, yes, come and enjoy the expo, but we're all closed up for the day. She did not take me back the very next day. <laughs> I ended up rectifying that by um, applying for an internship whenever I was in college to Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center where I got exposed to a lot of cool tech for the era such as the SGI IRIX desktop. Now the SGI IRIX desktop today lives on in the name of free and open source called the Max Interactive Desktop. So you can go and either install Fedora, which is more recommended, but I've heard of success on a Ubuntu and Debian variants, where you can go ahead and recreate the, the same memories that you had, uh, manipulating the desktop and the uh, um, the terminals and um, you know the the types of X applications that you were familiar with such as you know the calculator it, it's not that advanced but it's whatever brings joy to your heart this is the type of things that would bring joy to my heart it also bring joy to my heart to see yet another thing of um, my Pittsburgh supercomputing <coughs> Uh, vintage era time as a college intern back in 1999. We were required to log into a VMS system for all sorts of things, um, including submitting a timesheet. Open VMS is another way that free and open source software has picked up the ball for the um, my community of folks who continue to enjoy that particular vintage of um, computing. So I hear that there's one of these boxes for sh sale on the show for, so go check it out if this is something 
that makes sure your hearts sing. That is how I got my professional start in computing, and I had made my career somewhat circular by doing some consulting work with the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center earlier this year. So, oh goodness, yes, you can go back home after 17 years of absence and still find your, your own, still account still there. And my goodness, my files were still there. Files were still there 17 years later. How did they accomplish that? Open AFS. Again and again, I saw this trend of um, free and open source software continuing to give life to um, traditional computing. So I, I tried to, to pick, OK, where, what other Vintage just completely makes my heart sing, and um, that doesn't have anything to do with free and open source software. To see wh where did it go? So um, there was the TRS-80. That was the first computer in which I uh, ever written a program. I'm going to say circa 1990. Are there any TRS-80s on the floor today? I didn't see any. Oh, yeah. there, there are? Oh, fantastic. So there, there are some folks who um, share my particular love of this vintage. It is. Um, something that uh, I um, seem to grow fond of due to the, um, the ever-pressing um, threat of uh, a Catholic school teacher saying, oh no, you got, you got to try harder or else you're just not getting it. But I never owned a TRS-80 in my home. So where did the TRS-80 go? Who acquired it? How did it happen? Well, it was a, a Radio Shack product, right? And the product line actually ended in the Tandy 2000, and it ran Microsoft DOS. So the Tandy 2000 wasn't that different from any other x86 running Microsoft DOS at that vintage, but it was definitely a trend that Radio Shack continued to see that they had to innovate to bring personal computing to people's homes. While I didn't own a Tandy TRS, 80 nor a Tandy 2000. I did own a PS2. So the PS2 was an IBM product. I might get back to that later. I'm not sure if I'll have time. So Tandy, um, they continue to do the x86 computers until they were acquired by Compaq. But also around that time, they made a um, computer that was a handheld computer. That's something that I always dreamed of whenever I was uh, coding on the TRS-80 as to what we were going to um, be using in the future. I also was fond of um, the TI-82 calculators. And I, I saw this. Uh, 
as something is a, a way of the future that you could write something that wasn't quite basic level of code on the um, TI-82, but um, it, it was enough to give me some glimpse, some glimmer into the future as to where this was going. So the Tandy came out with something called the Tandy Zoomer. I never even heard of this uh, product until I had um, done some research for this talk. But I see a smile in the back. <laughs> Did anybody own the Zoomer? Yeah, you own the Zoomer? Can, can you tell me about it? really a, uh, essentially a PC. It has 640 by 480. Uh, no, wait, I'm sorry, 320 by 240. Um, monochrome LCD display. Uh, it, it ran GEM, a version of GEM, I think. Um, and it had the, uh, the graffiti interface from Palm. I think before Palm started doing its own equipment. So. I'm glad that you mentioned the graffiti interface from Palm because a, what a lot of people will like to discuss on the internet is the vintage or, or retro computing that really did innovate at the time. And, but it's no more, that the, the features just dropped no longer. I, was particularly fond of the the graffiti style of inputs and I hear some applause from the front row thank you sir and uh, I, I did hear some mumblings about keeping that alive through free and open source software but I, I don't know if there's an official project behind it uh, another great um, feature of the Palm OS which I'm not sure if the Tandy Zoomer also had is that you could go ahead and beam your contact information from one person to the other with the infrared input output that that was um, particularly neat nowadays you have to present a, a business card either on your screen or in paper format that's got a QR code and then that person's got to have a QR code reader on their handheld device to go ahead and and scan it to uh, obtain all the contact information that you had but well, it was brilliant about the, the beam interface of the, the Palm OS is you could um, I would just automatically import into your address book and whenever it was time to um, export it, it was already synced to your desktop. So I, I did actually own a Palm OS. I, I liked it a lot. I liked it so much that I went ahead and bought the Trio, which was their smartphone line. Um, the smartphones came, though, with an actual cardboard keyboard, typically, rather than the Graffiti OS, I mean, the Graffiti input system, which was a bit of a trade-off, but I did enjoy the idea of being able to web browse and do email and even um, work with certain applications that I could find in, that were still downwards compatible with the Palm OS on the Treo. It, it was definitely an NFT device.
But the Treo went with WebOS, which had a Linux kernel. And I, I don't know if you've ever run WebOS. I sure did. I thought that was an extremely beautiful interface that is finally, finally being seen in uh, the Android interface for some of its very innovative features. You could uh, card through your applications. What I haven't seen the um, Android catch up with, though, is the way that Calm OS would throttle you in a way that would help you. It would say, wait, 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 wait. You have too many cards open. You got to choose as to which application card you still want to have open rather than letting your system ran just run out of control on you. But sadly, Palm OS was not very well uh, lived, but it was very well loved by those of the vintage who used it. So who acquired this web OS? HP. Wait, wait a second. Didn't Compaq get acquired by HP too? And didn't Palm HP acquire all of Palm OS? And so what did HP do with it? They had a CEO who said, we're going to put it in all the printers. So if you have a printer from about six years ago, from HP, it most definitely has a Palm OS mini tablet built right into it. But um, for whatever reason, that didn't continue to carry on. So um, is this whole chain dead? I'm not sure. Does anybody know? Or did, are we just happy to see it carry around? Let's talk about the PS2. The PS2 was my first home desktop computer. I liked it a lot. It was specifically the, the 4625 megahertz no math coprocessor, no ability to add math coprocessor. It, the processor itself was uh, hard soldered into the board, so there was no opportunity to make it more innovative with the super socket 486s that promised the Pentium level performance. So it would always live the way that it was first created. And those of us here at the Computer Vintage Festival are always um, striving for restoring your computers to its original um, condition, which is a really excellent project for anyone to undertake. Sadly, my particular opportunity to do that with that specific piece of hardware that I once owned is completely impossible because I had to give it away and I honestly forget who I gave it away to and if it has any potential of being out in somebody else's vintage computer festival, because I didn't see it out there, or if um, 
but what would probably be more likely to happen is if somebody else happened to have that same very model in um, a vintage uh, festival such as this that I would be able to come up to and um, feel it out, be like, oh, wow, here I am. Uh, I feel at home again. And all the, the great memories come back. Um, but how, how does innovation wor work into this? I follow a Facebook group for vintage computing, as I'm sure most of us here do as well. And I was drawn to a particular post made by a gentleman by the name of Henry who lives in Singapore. He's trying to restore a 386 a vintage of a PS2. Does anybody own one of those? No? Okay. Um, what is particularly frustrating to him is that he had all the original hardware sitting in his closet dormant for a decade or more and now he wants to bring it out and turn it back on. So uh, I encouraged him to, well, just do it. Um, but first he was just really, really cautious that perhaps something might um, spark on him, fire up, or otherwise cause his whole home to burn down. I, I stepped him through opening the case and cleaning out the insides of it. However, he just did not have a good time turning it on. And it has nothing to do, as far as I can tell, from inside the CPU. What it had to do from um, was that he tried to turn it on and the CPU didn't catch fire, but the monitor puffed smoke. So who's heard the, of the blue smoke? The blue smoke of death is what is definitely the fear of all of us vintage computer lovers because once the, the blue smoke emits, and sometimes you do see puff of smoke, sometimes you don't. There's just no turning back with that particular piece of hardware. Henry is not deterred. <laughs> Henry has decided to take his CRT into a computer shop to get it repaired because he believes that it's uh, just some capacitors that have blown inside the, the CRT. I concur. Does anybody have any other opinions? It's the, mo it's the most common problem and sometimes the cap takes other stuff with it and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the capacitors take stuff with it, sometimes they don't. Anyhow, um, before he decides that it's worth a try, he wants to make sure that the um, CPU will, in fact, boot. So he tried to turn it on without any display at all and heard no beeps. Now, I'm not sure if he was patient enough to wait through the, the whole memory count or if he had turned off the, the BIOS feature that would even um, do the memory count to begin with, but I do remember that it was a fairly lengthy procedure to, to sit through the memory count, whether you had a goodness a whole megabyte of RAM or if you had a, a smoking for a, a 386 vintage, that, that would be, a lot would be eight megabytes of RAM if it was even possible. I'm not really even sure. But, Anyhow, um, it, if there's anything else that um, could be possibly suggested for um, my poor friend Henry, let me know. I have videos of what 
inside the case looks like if anybody else has that sort of level of vintage of expertise. Um, my level of expertise of that precise vintage actually dates a little bit prior to my coming to Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center with that college internship. I was Best Buy Geek Squad before there was a Geek Squad. They just called them PC Techs back then, and they did in-store support in um, the late 1990s. Come on in, join us. And uh, what um, we would do is we would provide computer support and repair based on the service SKUs that were available, and that is something that is not only continuing to this day in Best Buy stores, but I have the capacity with the, the company that I'm working for right now, Argutech, to sell the service, not necessarily Best Buy, but to sell the service of a technician coming to your business to do that sort of repair if, if need be. But this is vintage. Um, I was incredibly astonished, back to Henry, that he was able to find a store in Singapore that was willing to repair his CRT. I live in Illinois. I live in Chicagoland. I do not know as to who I would pick up the phone and call if I was in a similar situation for repairing a CRT. Does anybody repair CRTs? Or do you just have to wait until you come to the Vintage Computer Festival to uh, pick the brains of other folks in similar predicaments? Well, I know that the, um, the main tech guy um, who at uh, my company had, has fixed a number of CRTs back before we ended up uh, replacing the, almost all of them with uh, LCDs. But uh, mm -hmm. it's ba I mean, basically, it's just a case of redo. I mean, basically, he doesn't really do anything other than VC connectors and redo capacitors. But on the other hand, that does fix a lot of them. So. Yeah, yeah, that, maybe, maybe that's the trick, to, to find somebody who um, was not only alive, but also was of um, a professional mind at that vintage to be able to um, help diagnose the problem specifically. Yeah, I mean, in, in this case, it wasn't a matter of um, him being an expert on monitors or him being a, um, mm -hmm. or, or the monitors being vintage at that point. It was mm -hmm. simply a case of, okay, we have this uh, $300 monitor, and if a technician can spend 10 minutes opening it up, so I mean, check a mm -hmm. couple of spots, and mm -hmm. then the company has saved <laughs> the cost of buying a new monitor. Mm -hmm. But um, I would expect that, um, I mean, there's a lot, as I said, I mean, basically, a lot of the time it's, it's simple things like caps that fail, and mm -hmm. sometimes they take other stuff with them, sometimes they don't, but if your choice, I mean, you fix the caps, and then if it doesn't work well, you, if you were going to toss it out anyway, you're, you've at least given it another shot, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's a very good point. Um, I'm glad that you brought up the idea of, well, you, we've got a, a technician on staff who can handle these types of things, who, and therefore um, save the company money by going ahead and repairing it rather than replacing it. But in the case of a CRT in 2017, how many times are we faced with the question of, geez, how much is it going to cost me to dispose of this rather than to, to use it again? And um, that, that brings me to the, also the not idea of 
um, how, how heroic this sort of event is because we have the opportunity to save a lot of hardware that would otherwise be disposed of. And it, it makes me think of it more along the terms of if you were going to an animal shelter and adopting a pet. If nobody picks up something who, that is there on the free pile by the end of business today, then I'm a little afraid as to what might occur with it. So um, love your computers, adopt them, foster them if, if possible. I, I completely understand I'm in a condo living situation that doesn't provide me the proverbial garage in which to tinker in. But for those who do have the, the space, the willingness to at least foster these treasured memories, it might not be your vintage, but it might be somebody's vintage. I heard another cr chuckle from the back of the room, and I'm going to pick on you therefore, sir. What is, what is your vintage? Well, I, I'm an Atari kind of person, so Atari 800, um, mostly the, along those lines. So um, I have a wife who's constantly telling me to get rid of computer <laughs> hardware and parts, so there's a constant struggle between me keeping it and her making me throw it out. So. <laughs> yeah. The, the Atari vintage is, is something that is definitely something that I appreciate but never got into myself, um, again, because of my overall background. We didn't have a computer of any sort in the home until the IBM PS 24625. But um, whenever I became able to purchase some things on my own, around 18 years old, I started to collect Atari 2600 cartridges. It was a way for me to recapture some things that I actually didn't even get a chance to capture in the first go round in the first place. So that, that brings me back to the idea of that vintage computing is just very, very, very personal. So it, it's either something that you had personally worked on as a professional, something that you had cherished as a child, or I'll throw you a curveball here, something that mom and dad had cherished as a child and now you want to play with it because you are a child. This is a calculator that I picked up at a yard sale about five years ago for a buck. It reminded me of a calculator that I had played with as a child whenever I was about two, three. It was, um, had a display similar to this. This is bright red. The display that I was used to was bright green. And um, it, it was, it was nice. It had an on-off switch like this one does. And it could do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Oh, wow. Didn't have a paper tape, but didn't need one. I have tried to, um, to get this working for use of my two-and-a-half-year-old son. But for whatever reason, any time I use the 9-volt batteries, it
it will kill the 9 volt in one session no matter if I turn on turn off the um, switch very promptly or not. Does anyone have any ideas as to why it eats batteries that fast? I, I don't see any reason why. I, yeah, I don't think that they used to, um, I, I mean, they used to be battery guzzlers, but not, uh, I mean, if you left them on, they might go for a few hours. Mm -hmm. and, and so if you left them on by mistake, your battery would be dead. Mm -hmm. And I remember, it in, and there were a number of people who commented, you shouldn't bother with, night, with alkaline for them because what's going to kill the battery, you're going to leave it on and the battery will be dead whether it's an alkaline or not. So therefore, just get the cheapest battery. <laughs> you know, oh, wow. But, okay. Um, but, but the, uh, but, no, but if you don't leave it on, yeah. then um, your battery should last decently. What I would suggest doing is, and some people out there may be able to help you with this, uh -huh. um, is hook it up to a bench, what, a bench power supply set, yes. to, set to 9 volts. Uh -huh. and see how much current it consumes. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm very interested in doing that. That's exactly so this, why uh, I brought there, it. I mean, I've seen a number, there are a number of people out there who are bench supplies for various purposes, so if you're asking mm -hmm. for help, they should be able to probably help you. And I would get, I mean, if you're, I mean, well, I mean one thing that may be going on is that the, um, it may be that the power switch um, is designed so that it shorts out the, um, I mean, it should disconnect the battery and short mm -hmm. out the, um, the, you know, discharge all the capacitors in the system to ground, mm -hmm. um, so that they, that way, um, because sometimes if systems, if the power goes partially away and mm -hmm. they come back, that can leave things in a weird, confused state. Sure. So, but if there's some gunk or something on the switch that when it's turned mm -hmm. off, it shorts the output side to ground, but mm -hmm. leaves the battery connected, mm -hmm. then that would very quickly deplete the battery with the thing off. In fact, mm -hmm. it would deplete the battery even faster with the thing off than with the thing on. And again, if wow. you, and again, if you hook it up to a supply, uh -huh. um, if you see that the thing draws 40 milliamps when it's on and 500 milliamps when it's off, mm -hmm. then you know, okay, uh, you need to have somebody go in and fix the switch. Okay. Very good. I'll pass it around in case anybody wants to see it. Definitely give it back to me. It, what I thought was particularly impressive about this particular piece of hardware is that there was instructions as to how to use it and it's not reverse Polish notation which I definitely would need instructions as to how to use it if it wasn't. But, um, yeah, um, it has a, um, simply a numeric serial number, um, as well as an address as to how to get a hold of these people. The National Semiconductor Co Corporation of Santa Clara, California. Do those people exist? National Semiconductor? Yes. Uh, well, I don't know if the, I, I know that there's National Semiconductor. I think it uh, still makes chips, mm -hmm. at least they did into the night. I mean, I, I guess the, um, they did as long as my company kept using paper data books. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, I mean, I, I think Nat Semi um, still exists if you, if, I think it would be natsemi.com would be the, what sort of products do they make? Chips. They make chips. They don't care about calculators. They make chips. I, th I think, yeah, I think that companies like Texas Instruments okay. and National Semiconductor, okay. um, they need when they came up with chips, they needed something to put the chips in. Okay. And so there was a natural synergy there and okay. I think at TI their calculators enough people want this exact calculator mm -hmm. that TI still has reason to keep making them. I mm -hmm. don't think national semiconductor calculators ever attained anything near that status. So 
well, since I, I mentioned the reverse Polish notation. HP. So does it all come back to HP? HP isn't even one company anymore. There's Hewitt Packard and there's Hewitt Packard Enterprise. The enterprise people care about things like the, um, well, show you another connection. Remember I was ta talking about the um, <coughs> SGI? HPE acquired SGI. <coughs> so maybe it all does come back to HP, doesn't it? Or maybe there is a better way. I think that there is a better way. My sir Shirt is the from the Ohio Linux Fest, vintage eight years ago. And what it asks at the bottom of it, how can free change the world? I'm thinking about different pieces of this puzzle, there was the, the Max Interactive, that's Max with a double X, they're the ones who provide the ability to run the typical indie desktop on a Fedora system. And then it makes me wonder, well, does, doesn't it all come back to free? Free as in freedom. Free as in the Free Software Foundation. Free as in GNU's not Unix. Wonderful things that GNU's not Unix has adopted is the support for uh, <coughs> compilers in a free way. You can run Fortran. You can run COBOL if you want to. I particularly was probably one of the last college kids to take a COBOL class, so I thought. I talked to um, some people that I had worked with at Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center 18 years ago and who are still there today. One of them says, Oh yeah, I teach a class at Carnegie Mellon School of Computer Science. What's it in? COBOL. Maybe it is worth it to learn the classics. Maybe we shouldn't just deprecate our technology. Maybe we should just keep these alive and, and innovate them. And definitely within the free and open source way. And if they're hardware, perhaps we do foster them. <coughs> I was fortunate enough to buy one of the badges, but I have not been fortunate enough yet to claim one of the badges. The, the show badge, I've been told, is made out of mostly refurbished hardware that people have scrounged and made a new living breathing computer. If that is an innovation in vintage computing, I don't know what is. Does anybody know if um, my badge is still available? Maybe, maybe not. I'll, I'll see once I get out there. And
and um, that that's what we do, and that's what we do it for the the love of the the vintage, however it came to us, whether it be via firsthand professional experience, childhood experience, trying to relive childhood memories, trying to recreate a childhood, or even coming back to share with the next generation your cherished childhood things. See if they get it. Who knows if they will? Who knows if they don't? I'll close with um, one perhaps chilling thought to really seem to help you to, to motivate you to uh, understand what exactly is at stake here. Because sometimes vintage computing seems at odds with innovation. Every so once in a while, I, I see online some discussion how we should completely deprecate the instruction of cursive handwriting in K through 12 schools. Because everybody is going to own a computer of some sort and things are going digital to sign, things are going to be um, so definitely electronic such that we shouldn't bother teaching our children cursive. Again, I have a two and a half year old son. I want him to learn cursive. I want him to learn cursive so that he can sign his name. Signing your name is still in, in 2017. If you go to a situation like closing on a house, it is not sufficient to go ahead and digitally sign your name. You cannot phone it in. You have to appear in person, and it's got to be legally certified for you to, in fact, get the deed of the real estate transaction that you're undertaking. It's really important for things that is, are as personal as buying or selling your home. Thought back on other pieces of vintage, of other innovations that have just suddenly collapsed, gone, dead, or just not quite duplicated by our current innovations. Very complicated enough is if you want to go ahead and sign a document where it, it's got to be in ink that you have to show up in person, you have to pass the documents around the closing table if it's a, a real estate transaction, for example. However, not all scenarios would, uh, where you're entering a legal contract necessarily have that opportunity. I remember back in my Best Buy vintage time, what we did is we had carbon copies. People would decide that they wanted a, a specific computer service. They would sign their name saying, yes, I agree to pay this much for these types of services that are, are rendered. But now um, there is not that opportunity. Why? Where did all the carbon go? Where did all the carbon paper go? And um, for transactions of um, Automotive shops. Automotive shops might be the, the last application that I could understand of this. It's the good old dot matrix printers that would make an impression all the way through a carbon piece of paper such that you could not only um, make an original but a copy that was then printed and then signed by a human being. <coughs> Where else has this been duplicated in the innovation of otherwise technology? Nowhere. The answer that keeps coming back 
to is the e-signing. And we should just go ahead and ditch cursive at our elementary schools. I firmly disagree because, for one thing, the only computer that they cannot take away from you, right here, your mind. It's very important. Thank you all for joining us. I hope to see you at the Ohio Linux Fest. Let me know if I can help you. I'm going to certainly take my calculator out into the show floor and see if anybody can help me with this power draining problem. Yes, sir, question in the back. Well, a comment. Yes. for that calculator, the Novus 850 model. So uh, it may be historical in a sense, maybe not that particular one, but it looks like it might be that they have it at the Smithsonian and that it was circa like 1974. 1974, wow, before I was born. So, happy that you found that. Thank you, thank you, yes. That, that definitely gives um, a certain generational uh, vintage love to it because then y you are perhaps acquiring what, passing down what a professional of my son's grandparents' era might have used. Very cool. Very cool. Hope you guys enjoy the computer. Vintage Festival and the rest of the show. Thank you.